Good afternoon. On behalf of Fleischman Hillard Boston and our colleagues around the agency, we thank you for joining. I'm Seth Bloom, and I'm proud to say I've been a part of this team since 2001. Now, normally the moderator spot for a webinar like this would be reserved for someone smartly sharing some context and bringing the audience into the right frame of mind for the topic at hand. But as we put the finishing touches on today's session, it, be quickly, it quickly became clear that that wasn't necessary here because you and we and the world are all immersed in the COVID-19 context. It's our life right now. We are all spending our days dealing with the personal, professional, and policy ramifications of the pandemic. So given that, and given that we have assembled an incredibly smart team of speakers to talk with you today, I'm going to thank you all for joining. I'm going to thank the panelists, outline the agenda, and get out of the way. A few words on the format. We thought this session would be most helpful if we gave brief but tangible overviews of five areas and left plenty of time for questions where we can drill down on any of the areas that are most interesting and helpful to you. And of course, we can always take the conversations offline if we hit on something that you're grappling with. The sections we'll talk through are an overall state of play from the FH COVID-19 task force lead, employee communications in the new normal, event participation in a virtual world, media and social behavior, and crisis preparedness and management. Now, many of our speakers will reference some fresh research our true global intelligence team has just released. It was based on responses from over 6,500 consumers, and it's fascinating. The entire study is available at fleischmanhiller.com, but you'll hear some of the key stats over the next hour. It's safe to say, though, that the findings reveal momentous changes in consumers' priorities, values, and relationships that are shaping the way we need to do our jobs during the pandemic and even long after we reach the other side. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ken Fields. Ken? Good day, everybody. Thanks, Seth, and thank you for uh, making time to join us today. Um, I'm going to speak to you on behalf of a task force that we have established. As you'll see on the next slide, the task force is designed to make sure that we're helping clients stay ahead of this situation and um, deliver to them the points of view that can help them anticipate and uh, drive to the kinds of solutions that they need to achieve. Um, those kinds of situations have been, um, as you'll see on, the, on another slide here in just a second, th those kinds of situations have been predictable by the topic um, that uh, we've seen, and they've also been predictable by the um, region um, that uh, 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 folks are facing. Um, so we know as these waves have occurred, um, as the pandemic occurred, we have seen the um, uh, same types of issues affect clients uh, in a thematic way, um, uh, very uh, in concentrated forums. And so we've actually been able to work with clients in advance of a moment and then help them, uh, help other clients anticipate the kinds of things that they, that they may be facing. So if we could advance the slides um, just a bit, that would be uh, helpful. Thanks. You'll, you'll see the full of the pan, the full panel there in just a second. You'll see each of these folks. And if you could go to the next slide again, um, uh, this is a defining moment for uh, many of us. You'll see the quote from Bill Gates, who indicated this is a really defining moment for our lifetime. Our advice to clients right now is to help them anticipate and prepare to define their company, their CEOs, um, uh, and their other executives' um, perceptions, uh, and to define the relationships that they have with stakeholders now. Those are being established now. How um, you are dealing with this situation will determine your relationship with those stakeholders, the perceptions that people have of your CEO and other executives, and really the view that people have of your company. And we recognize that this is that sort of defining moment. As I alluded to, and you'll see on the next slide, we've seen these waves occur. Um, and these waves have been, um, go back one slide, just please, thank you. These waves have been, as I mentioned, by topic and by region. For example, some clients were initially engaging us to work with what do I do with a, with a positive test among our employees or client or customer base? How do I communicate that to others? 
Then the next wave was, how are people dealing with the exposure of employees? And the next wave was, how do I notify our customers that they may have been exposed in some way? Then how do I talk about shutting down our facility or keeping our essential facility and workers moving? And then how do I talk about PPE? Those waves have occurred and been predictable. And we expect that in recovery, there will be predictable waves as well. Also, what's reinforced for us is the need to integrate all efforts because of the role that government and media and employees and all of your stakeholders are really playing in this and the information they need from you. It's really critical that you have all of those functions and communications outlets integrated so that no one is communicating in a vacuum. All of the audiences and stakeholders that you have are going to um, uh, be consuming the information that you share. The other thing that we would say is it's critical given the um, uh, speed with which this has evolved to really be planning now for in, in this moment in uh, relation to recovery, but you may also be ready to plan for a second wave that many healthcare experts expect will occur once we begin to reopen. So being aware of each of those um, things is gonna be really important and help bring some measure of predictability to what feels like a sort of out of control situation. As you look on the next slide, we, uh, Seth alluded to the research that we've done. I just wanna to touch on a couple of key points from that research. Um, people expect this is gonna take a long time. Your employees expect that, your customers expect that. You'll see um, that 22% of them think it's gonna take somewhere between five months and two years to sort of get back to anything like what we knew before. People are aware of that. And the other point that you'll hear is that those consumers we surveyed, again, as a large sample globally, were very much of a mind that you needed to really be taking care of your employees, that how you treat your employees is a defining part of this defining moment for you. You can see some of the data there, but there are really 91% of the people that we surveyed that said they're willing to take some action um, in support of employees. And that's a pretty uh, a startling statistic. Um, if you could jump to the next slide, we'll talk about some of the ramifications for that as well. This is, in, in many ways, the data tell us that this is a permanent change. 68% of those consumers said that this has changed the kinds of things that they think are important, the kinds of products and services that they think are important. And the 52% think they're gonna make changes in the purchasing decisions and the other uh, sort of life decisions that they make as a result of this. What do we do with all that information? As we look at the next slide, we'll just briefly touch on this and then it will lead into our conversation about how to sort of address the employee stakeholders. First, you have to really, based on what the data, the data tells us to really live your values, to be clear that your values are more important than they've ever been to all of your stakeholders. And you can see some of the ways in which that may manifest um, listed there. Also recognizing that the fundamentals have changed in many ways. One of the things the data tells us is that we have seen very clearly that the role of government is gonna be more um, impactful to all of us, our businesses, uh, our social institutions, at least for a while. Recognizing that that's the case and that you have to navigate in that environment and that you may have to demonstrate how you're uh, interacting or cooperating with government is really important. And then as we move toward recovery, it's gonna be really important to recognize the pain that's still being felt by a lot of people as we start to reopen the economy and making sure that you're pacing that conversation so it doesn't feel like you're uh, unsympathetic or ignoring the kinds of impacts, real life impacts that have happened as a result of, of what's occurring. And a big part of what we saw in the survey, as I mentioned, is um, how do you focus on putting employees first? And my colleague, Josh Rogers, is gonna talk uh, a bit more about how you communicate in the life of the employee needs. Thank you, Cam. Um, hi, everybody. So for all of you on the call, uh, whether employee comms is your area of expertise or not, you're probably spending uh, at least some, if not most of your time, thinking about how to uh, keep your employee population informed and engaged. And if you're not, you should be uh, assuming that responsibility doesn't live with somebody else inside your, your organization. And on the next slide, you'll see why. Um, 
the, the Fleischman Hillard research that you've heard about so far demonstrates that of, of all the institutions you see on this slide, consumers have major corporations and employers bringing up the rear in terms of uh, how, how we're responding. And that, of course, is all of us on this call. Um, so on the next slide, we'll, we'll take a look at what uh, some of the implications of, of that are. Uh, despite the, the fragile economy that they're asking every four employees, this doesn't include um, the self-employed, but, but one in every four uh, report at least 14% say they will look at how a company behaved when considering whether to work there. 10% will no longer be loyal because of employer behaviors during the pandemic. And 9% intend to look for a job within a company that better supports its people. So clearly these numbers point to a big potential impact on engagement, productivity, and, and retention. And all of that stuff obviously is worth paying attention to. But as we've all seen by now, this doesn't just play out within, within the, the walls of your business. Um, on the next slide, um, we'll kind of underscore what we already know, and that's that consumers are paying very close attention as well. So in, in our research, 52% of consumers say employers taking care of their people, better care of their people, uh, is very important to them. And 32% intend to take action, buying from companies that took care of their employees during the pandemic. So what should you do with these data? Um, we have um, organized on, on the next slide, you'll see um, three broad areas of, of thinking, um, areas in which you ought to be focusing right now. And foundational to everything you're doing, you need to be keeping your employees informed, engaged, aligned throughout all of this. You need to make sure that they feel valued and appreciated. And that, as most of you know, is a lot easier said than done, particularly if yours is an organization in which you have employees who are able to work from home while others are still on the front line. There's a lot of tension that results from that. Um, you might look at this first column and say, oh, we've been doing that for six weeks now. We're good there. Well, that's great, but you need to keep doing that. Um, that work has to continue while you're continuing to deal with some of the other challenges that are coming your way. And those challenges are big. Um, Ken talked about some of those in, in his remarks. Um, but among the bigger issues that, that organizations are likely to face, some of you might have already um, encountered these, uh, layoffs, furloughs, facility closings, um, having to notify your employees or your external stakeholders, which could include customers, suppliers, other business partners, that one of your people uh, is sick and that they might have been exposed um, or that one of those stakeholders might have exposed one of your employees. Um, worst of all, um, you might have to deal with communicating that somebody within your organization has died as a result of, of the virus. And um, to, to, you're, you're probably seeing a theme here, or I hope that you will, um, with respect to all of this happening in, in phases. and, and People are going to come, organizations will come in and out of these phases. Um, these challenges also aren't going away for a while. So it's really important that you're doing scenario planning for, for these different situations. And all the while, of course, you need to be thinking about the return. Um, and there's a ton to think about here, obviously, too. So if you look at the, the third column uh, on this slide, this is a framework that we've been using to categorize many, many of the um, the considerations that um, you should be examining right now. What does the team leading your, your return to the workplace effort look like and how are they working together? Um, there are obviously many considerations for the return itself. What sort of criteria will you put in place um, in order for people to return? How are you going to communicate those? Um, what are you going to need to do to the workplace itself? You probably will have to augment that environment in some way. There are policy considerations. The em employees within your organization, when they come back, they are, they are not coming back the same as, as before the pandemic. They are going to have different needs and issues that will, need, that will cause you to, need, uh, cause you to uh, think about how to evolve those policies and your benefits and the amenities that you offer. Um, 
and and you're you're going to need to support your people in a way that you haven't had to do before. Um, you're going to have to facilitate um, new support measures and um, new ways of demonstrating you care and, and, and facilitating more flexibility for your people. And when you look at this, it might not feel like the typical realm of employee comms, and, and it's not. But today, employee comms is just about, it's just as much about creative and innovative problem solving as it is facilitating that flow of information and, and driving uh, employee engagement. But that flow of information has to happen too at the same time. And um, inside, uh, outside your organization, and um, that's an area where you need to stay focused. And, and for many of you, events uh, are a big way that, that you have uh, facilitated that flow of information and engagement of stakeholders before. So uh, I'll pass it over to Sarah to talk about um, how to do that in the event space. Thanks, Josh. Uh, good afternoon. Happy to be here speaking with you right now. As you know, businesses like your, your own and those around the globe are grappling with figuring out what is Plan B, right? Now that in-person meetings and gatherings and all events are on hold. Well, at Flation Hillard, we're advising pretty much all of our clients to plan to work in a virtual world at least through the end of the year. Even as travel bans are lifted and it's unlikely that employers will easily send employees around the world to do any in-person meetings before then, Therefore, the time is now to plan for your own virtual event. It may be your own event that you've been planning. It may be one you're participating in. You really just don't want to lose the momentum that you gain from face-to-face -face interaction. And going dark for the next eight months isn't really an option. So virtual events are the new normal, and I have some things for you to consider. Timing. Your virtual event does not need to match up exactly with what you had planned to do in real life. It can be on your own timeline when you're ready to go. So think about that for the timing. The content development, likely you are planning on uh, starting and creating content in form of videos, graphics for your next event. Still push on, but with an eye toward what works best in a virtual world. Um, also keep in mind that you can still capture really great new content during that virtual event to be used later on your social platforms, your own website, and through targeted emails. Um, we also know that sitting at your computer for long stretches of time is nearly impossible. We all have distractions coming from multiple directions, whether it's your kids, your pets. But when structuring your virtual meeting, try not to have people sit for more than an hour. Give them breaks spread out longer meetings over a few days, even send something fun to their house that they can unbox during the meeting at a specific time. And one really big positive that is coming from a lot of the virtual events is a higher number of attendants. So in one instance, which I'll give more details on in just a second, an in-person user conference with 3,000 confirmed attendees turned into a 10,000 person virtual event. So speaking of real life events, quickly transforming into a virtual event, we actually ended up doing this very thing a few weeks ago. A client suddenly had to cancel that large in-person event and go 100% virtual. We quickly worked with a valued partner in the event production uh, industry, and over the course of 10 days, we pulled off a meeting that included keynotes, presentations, live question and answer sessions, and breakouts. And for a few reasons, we had to use Facebook Live to do the main event, but we also used other technologies uh, to help coordinate all of the speakers, the video roles, the insertions, and also for creating and or capturing uh, the content that was developed. Um, and quickly looking at the detailed run of show, you can see there was a large level of detail needed when coordinating dozens of speakers around the United States. Um, so this wouldn't be necessary for all events, just those with more than, let's say, like seven to eight speakers. But the result was a very happy client who successfully unveiled a new product to more than 10,000 potential users. So if you do have an event that's in the back of your mind that you'd like to have us think about, taking into consideration your goals, your audience, your content, and your call to action, we can assist in choosing the best platform 
to really bring that to life and bring it to reality. And now just touching on the media side of our new virtual world. Um, at FH, we are doing daily media monitoring, with, you know, finding out what reporters are reporting on, what are the hot topics of the day, what's trending, and advising our clients on when it's prudent to move forward with more reactive and proactive pitching. Currently, I would say about 80% of our pitching is COVID related. And as um, and, and what, that's what the audience is asking for. We're seeing some fatigue. I mean, there's always so much that we can hear at the end of the day. Um, the message is to be conscientious and choose your messages very carefully. The broader narrative right now is focused on the chain of impact spurred by the initial crisis. And that includes topics like how economies right, may reopen, the hidden impact of the health crisis, what the new normal looks like, mental health and well-being, consumer confidence in the economy, the wealth gap, environmental benefits and challenges spurred by the crisis and the triumphs and challenges of technology. I'm sure some of us are zoomed out at this point. One very hot topic to pitch when a business is when a business is making a charitable or a feel-good announcement, helping out those frontline healthcare workers is something we're seeing a lot as well as stories of what's gonna happen over the next couple of months um, when businesses start to reemerge from lockdown. Um, also, media are keeping track and keeping score of what companies are doing during this unprecedented time. And like Josh mentioned, watching how employees are treated by companies. And they'll certainly keep that in mind for future reporting. And speaking of employees, media are feeling the pinch and the effects of coronavirus, a lot of layoffs, um, a lot of furloughs, and if they're not being laid off or furloughed, their beats have changed to cover COVID in their realm. So they're, they're really being put through a lot and they're, the, the, the crunch of the output of what they need to do is, is pressing. So keeping that in mind when reaching out to them is also something really important to keep in mind. Also, media events. They were a really big money maker for media companies, again, being canceled or postponed, just like our own one, own consumer and corporate events are being canceled. So they're really feeling that pinch financially as well. Um, so now I wanna toss it to my uh, colleague, Allison Carley, who can give you her insights on social media. Thanks, Sarah. So to give a quick overview of social, we wanted to share what we found to be a few top must-dos and best practices as we continue to move through this situation together. Um, so to start, broadly speaking, we recommend focusing on these three priority must-dos during this time, the first of which we might argue is the number one must-do, and that is to listen. Uh, finding your place right now as a brand really begins and ends with your audience. It's critical to understand the sensitivities, any polarizing topics within those groups, as well as where you best fit in the conversation, which is obviously constantly evolving and changing. So with that, at minimum, that means monitoring industry hashtags, competitor feeds, conversations, of course, on your own channels, uh, just to make sure you're always getting that critical baseline insight that you can build around. Uh, it's also important to make sure you're being internally proactive and prepared by building an escalation protocol, uh, knowing how quickly things can change and impact particular audiences from employees to customers. Make sure you have a clear governance process so you know who should be involved if issues arise on your channel so you aren't scrambling when a difficult moment strikes. Um, additionally, aim to help your communities when possible. Uh, this can obviously take many forms, but as you listen to your communities and plan your own content, see where you can help. Uh, in many ways, that simply comes down to seeing where you can add value in their lives and be empathetic to their current and evolving needs. Um, but this is arguably the most important proactive and reactive lens that you should be using on, on all work streams during this time. So to that end, moving into social content planning. Uh, as I just said, it, it can be a tricky time to find your brand's right place uh, in the conversation right now. Obviously, you don't want to be adding to any noise, but business is still moving forward. It's appropriate and in many cases necessary to publish content. Um, big picture, the most important rule, again, no surprise here, but your focus should be centered on your audience, not on you as a brand. 
Um, this is also a moment to just think about the value that your brand is uniquely positioned to offer and deliver during this time. For the most part, uh, we found the um, following lenses, thanks. <laughs> um, oh, going back. Uh, the following lenses here, these four lenses, um, are applicable to most brands when thinking about the type of value you can offer from your social content. Uh, the first of which being how you can help your communities. Um, what kinds of resources, products, services, assistance are you providing or are you able to provide to those who need it during this time? Uh, what kinds of helpful information can you offer? Is there education, tips, practices, things that might be needed or desired? Um, also thinking about how you can provide leadership. Um, what is the guidance, advice, inspiration that you can give to those who need it? And lastly, celebration. Obviously, this can sometimes needs to be tempered carefully, but there's a lot of good that's happening right now. So how can you uplift people in your community and spotlight them, your employees and others during this time? Uh, and of course, doing all of this with the right uh, humility, understanding, empathy, all those characteristics that continue to show, you know, you're, you're being audience first in everything you're doing. And then moving into other streams of social activity, we won't have time today to dig into the details around paid media, uh, influencers, exec, social, and beyond. Um, on the next slide, please. Uh, those obviously have their own nuances to consider uh, during this time, but broadly speaking, I do believe that many of the lenses and sensitivities that we've just covered uh, can still be applied to make sure that your activations in these particular work streams are landing right with your audience groups um, at all times. Um, similarly, as we move past the peak of the crisis, um, many of these principles will still apply, but naturally we'll shift a bit um, for people messaging will likely need to evolve reflect the current moment and what's next. Um, there's, of course, an opportunity, for example, to share, you know, reflections and, and learnings from the past, as well as a shared vision for the future. Uh, really start building those custom strategies now, thinking about the next chapter and, and where your brand will fit in that. Um, and with that, the final tip for today is just to reevaluate frequently. Everything obviously remains very unpredictable and is changing so rapidly with a lot of unknowns. So continue to listen closely to your latest audience needs, about the value you can offer them today and possibly tomorrow, ideally tomorrow too, uh, and just keep evolving your social plans accordingly as you go. Thanks, Allison. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, one of the things that we try to focus on in crisis management and preparedness, as you'll see on the next slide, um, the, the, is data. And data can be very instructive about you know, where you spend your time and effort in preparing for the next, uh, the next type of issue that, you, that you're going to be faced with. And as you can see from this slide with some of the you know, key numbers here, I'd like to point to the ones all the way on the right side. Um, when you think about the, the massive scale of this crisis that everybody's dealing with, the initial waves of it were really um, having people focus about what this crisis means to them and, uh, and, and the immediacy of troubleshooting or putting out fires in your own operations and communicating with your own employees about the workplace and, and what, uh, you know, what's next there. But the numbers on the right really um, are instructive because, you know, when you look at a number like 78% uh, are concerned for their health, 74% are concerned uh, about their financial situation, that's adding a crisis on top of the crisis already that you're already dealing with. So it, it's really about, you know, figuring out what other emotional needs and responses you're going to have to prepare for. Um, and, 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 and basically layer on top of uh, the operational and, and initial reputational and, and communications uh, issues you do have to deal with. But then thinking about your employee base, as, as Ken and Josh and, uh, and, and Allison and Sarah have talked about, uh, and, and really focusing on what are their needs beyond what they need to know for us uh, at, at the workplace. How are they feeling? How are they reacting to this? What is their family situation? What is their workplace situation? Um, so so that, that kind of data uh, there would really help us instruct them what we need to kind of prepare to mitigate against. Um, and it, it also puts an even greater emphasis on an, an unprecedented level of emphasis on you know, an organization's reputation, because as Josh and Ken have referenced, you know, the number one driver 
uh, right now and how uh, consumers and people uh, take, are, are looking at organizations and brands and their reputation is how they take care of their employees. So it's really about rewriting uh, the social contract between companies and employees. And um, and as you'll see on the next slide, we, despite you know all of these massive uh, changes and unprecedented situations that we're in, uh, good crisis management principles still apply. Um, you know, you know it, it's not. It, it, some folks probably find themselves trying to figure out, hey, how do I just survive in the midst of all this? Um, but it's not just about surviving right now. It's also a potential opportunity to seize the moment, uh, to show your values in, in, in action, and, and really strengthen and deepen your relationships with, with all your stakeholders. You know, obviously the employees being uh, one of the key ones. Um, it's also about, you know, and there's an old line uh, that I think Vince Lombardi is, is quoted as saying, I'm sure it came from somebody prior to him, but you know, adversity doesn't build character, it reveals character. So this is an opportunity for organizations to really, uh, you know, to, to, to show who they are and, and show how important they, uh, they, they think and see their employees uh, being. Um, it's also, you know, important to keep in mind that, you, you know, you have to start and act with, with who that audience is, is in mind, and it can't just be about you and your issues. You know, everyone is in crisis right now. Um, everyone has their own concerns and issue. Um, what are you doing not only to, to help from an operational perspective and, you, and support your employees, but what else are you doing to make a difference? You know, some companies out there have shifted their manufacturing lines or uh, production lines to make PPE for, for uh, healthcare workers in the midst of this crisis. Some companies are in organizations are uh, providing community relief or support for healthcare workers. So, um, you know, yes, initially, you know, you need to look at, you know, something like this and how it affects your organization. But as you look toward reopening, returning to the workplace and recovery, what else is your organization doing, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to make a difference and, and help people through all this uh, tremendous change? You know, the other part of this, I think Sarah mentioned in, in her piece, is everyone's keeping score. Everyone's watching, there's a scorecard. Um, so really you're gonna be judged on how you behave, not necessarily just what you say, but how you behave, what your actions look like uh, as, as we get through this. Um, and, and I think Ken had mentioned this uh, previously as well, you know, in, in the crisis management and response uh, functions, it's in, you know, critically important to integrate those so that you have alignment both on the operation side, but also, you know, the communication side and within the communications, you know, PR, corp comm, employee comms, IR, uh, government affairs, you know, making sure that everybody's on the same page and, and, and uh, uh, sharing the same message and thinking about who, who their audiences are and what they need to hear from them. Um, and, and then ultimately, when you think about um, the, you know, what's going on out there, you have White House daily briefings, you have, you know, uh, governors speaking from state capitals doing press briefings, um, you know, new, new issues can come at you at any moment if anybody references your industry or your organization specifically. So you need to be, we need to be planning for anything that calls, uh, you know, that, that comes from those types of daily press briefings. Um, and thinking about the next wave of this crisis, but also anything that uh, calls trust and confidence into question. I mean, that's gonna be an increasingly important um, uh, finger on the pulse uh, to make sure that you understand you know, how you're being perceived, how you're uh, being talked about in the conversation, and how your message is resonating and landing uh, with, with your audiences to make sure that you're, you're building that trust and, 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 uh, and trying to instill as much confidence as possible. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, back to Ken to talk about a few takeaways. Thanks, John. It's good to know that in a crisis like no other, uh, some of those same uh, principles of good, effective crisis management really apply. In that vein, we thought it'd be helpful to just kind of summarize some of what we've talked about so far. That starts with deciding now who you want to be in this process, um, understanding how you can prioritize your employees, and their and your customers and their families. It's not just the people that you're encountering, it's their families and those people have real concerns about what um, uh, things their family members have been exposed to, to just recognize that. Also, when we say look around and look ahead, we mean understand the people who are right in your path and the impact this is having on them, but also plan for 
what can be happening. There's so much of this has been evolving so quickly that that plan is really important. And then just a couple of other points from this last slide. Empathy is really going to be critical, and candor is what people are craving right now. They want to know the facts, and they want to know um, what you know and what you don't know. And one other point, this is not a moment to have a bunch of silos. This is not a moment to operate in the same way that you have in the past. This is a moment to break down those silos and make sure everybody is working across all of the functions to communicate with all of the stakeholders that you that you have. And then finally, I would say, make sure that you're keeping all of your leaders, as Josh alluded to, all of your leaders involved with all of their stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are employees or customers or investors, but making sure that those people are equipped and ready for tough conversations that are happening right now um, can be really, really, really impactful. We want to spend a lot of time answering your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Seth, who will help moderate us through that process. Thank you so much, Ken, and thanks to all of the speakers. Um, we're going to start our Q&A now. And just a reminder, uh, we'd like to have all of the panelists turn back on your camera so that we can see you all. Um, and we'll try to get questions around to everybody. And uh, I'd like to remind our attendees that if you have a question, please type it in the questions box in the questions section on your dashboard, or you can raise your hand, and of course we'll answer as many questions as we can that way too. Um, just a note, please don't use the chat feature. That's not where we'll see questions. So with that, I'm gonna start with a question that came in prior to, the, um, prior to starting, and it's for Sarah. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi. Sarah, do you recommend one platform or over another for virtual events? Which one, the questioner wants to know, generally offers the best user experience? Well, that's always the first question I get when people want to do or clients want to do a virtual event. What do I use? But I have to back them up, right? First, I need to know, what is your goal? You know, how many people are you going to want to engage? Is this going to be an international event? Is this just an event for people in one city? I need to know what your audience is. You know, is it internal? Is it your stakeholders? And then we need to know what kind of content. Are you going to be rolling a lot of videos? Do you want to do a virtual whiteboard, polling, uh, raffles? Any of these elements that really can add some excitement into an event would really help us figure out which platform you wanted to, wanted to use. And then what's your call to action at the end? Do you need registration information? Do you need to take a survey? So I ask those questions, which lead me to the platforms, and there's a lot of really great ones. First, we need to back you up and ask you those four or five questions to figure out what makes sense for what you want to do. So I think I answered your question, but not really. No, you sure did. Thank you. Um, Josh, I've got a question for you. Um, whose advice should we be following for developing a return to work approach and timing? And I think the questioner is intimating that there might be different answers depending on what you're listen, listening to. Yeah, it, and it's a great question. It's a question that, that's top of mind for pretty much everybody right now. And Ken, I'll invite you to hop in on this too. Um, but, you know, we, we talk about the importance of having a multidisciplinary task force within your organization to drive this. That task force ought to be informed um, by what's happening um, at, at various levels of government, um, um, you know, with, with your jurisdictions within which you, you sit. So it's, it's really helpful. Um, Ken and John both talked about the importance of um, not working in a siloed manner right now. Um, the, the public affairs team uh, is really critical in this situation because they have line, line of sight into what's happening at, at all of those different levels of government. And, and you know, I, I think looking at that, looking at, um, you know, ongoing at the, the recommendations of, of the CDC and, and the guidance that they're putting out there. And then you need to look at what's right for your organization too. And, and, um, and I think about when you, when you constitute your task force. So most of you probably have a, a COVID-19 task force right now already. Um, that ought to transition, obviously, into the return to work phase. And, and I think that task force ought to stay active 
return to work isn't a singular event. This is going to be an ongoing process. And, and that task force ought to stay active, meeting regularly, at least weekly, if, if not daily, particularly around some of the key milestones that, that you might be facing. And, and I think you need to look at your organization to determine how to best constitute that task force. Um, this is having a far-reaching effect on pretty much every function within every organization. So when we say multidisciplinary, it really should be multidisciplinary. You should listen to what all of your key functions within your organization need and, and what they're thinking about. If you're a global organization, um, highly recommend considering global participation on that task force. And then you might want to think about um, outside expertise to that you bring in, if not as, as permanent members of that team, um, at least in a, in a consultative mode um, from time to time. And that might include medical experts, um, you know, if you have access to epidemiologists or infectious disease specialists. Um, if you don't have an industrial hygiene capability within your organization, think about contracting with somebody from, from that specialty area to help you understand how you best ought to augment your workspace and, and manage social distancing and, and disinfecting and things like that. So it, it's a long way of saying that um, you, you need to look at what's right for your organization, but you need to look at, um, at, at the various policies and regulations that are happening outside um, that are kind of governing the world at large when it comes to the return. Yeah, Josh, I would just say there's also a, a report that Johns Hopkins put out. It's the Center for Health Security, I think, is the name of it. It's been to inform government governors about how to reopen based on kind of the industry classification that you're in. It's a really helpful tool. If folks are interested, we can certainly send that around, but it is publicly available. Great. Thank you both. I'm going to combine two questions that came in the questions box, and there's a lot of them. Thanks, everyone, and keep them coming. Um, Carico and Michael both um, asked uh, similar questions, and I'm going to I'm going to throw it to Sarah. They're media relations questions, and um, if I put them together, what are reporters telling you these days? Um, obviously, everyone is busy and overwhelmed. Is this a time to stand down on lukewarm media pitches? Um, uh, can we begin building industry story pitches for post-pandemic preparedness? Um, or are we, are we, and, and finally, are we COVID-19 only at this time or are we opening up a bit? Right. So yes, we need to be um, clear in what we're pitching. The majority of what we're seeing still go out and get pickup and get some traction is COVID related. What we are telling clients now, if it is slower and you don't have a strong message and you need to stand down, now is the time to mine for those stories that we are going to pitch months down the road or to do planning or to do updates and we're doing that for a number of clients right now but again you don't want to appear tone deaf and go to a reporter who is solely writing about the pending recession or you know layoffs and pitch them something that's so far off base that we look like we're not paying attention reporters want to feel important and they want to know that you're reading what they're writing or you know watching what they're saying and to pitch them something that isn't really fitting into what they are reporting on right now would not be an appropriate use of um, your time and it would eventually harm your own reputation moving forward. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let's see, we might start this one um, with, uh, with Josh and Ken. Um, what's your view on responding to media inquiries on how we're handling the pandemic internally? Um, one example would be how is your company handling the return to work? Do you think it's best to be tight-lipped, um, openly share, or somewhere in the middle? Um, and what are the implications and value there of responding to inquiries for the brand? Yeah, Josh, I can start. Um, I think recognize that the stakeholders that you have are um, both internal, but they speak externally. <clears throat> so we were on the phone with clients yesterday, multiple clients yesterday, who have written a piece of communication that is intended to be internal, but we all recognize it was gonna immediately be leaked given the number of people that it was gonna go to. So I think, and also there are many, um, most uh, organizations would view the communities around them as stakeholders too. So. Um, it really depends on the individual situation, but I do think there's merit in being ready to talk publicly 
about anything that you're saying to a large number of employees in, uh, privately, it's going to get out and you need to be able to put it in context. The clients that we were speaking to yesterday had in mind that they might just keep, they might just use their internal statement uh, uh, for employees. They might just use that externally when asked that there was information in there that really wasn't the main point that they would want to deliver to the community. So we counseled them through, really, you can take a better shot at the media explanation of this and the stakeholders who are going to be reached by that um, uh, medium, uh, rather than just blindly sort of handing over the internal communication. You want to make sure you're maximizing that opportunity to get the story out that the people who are consuming the media will um, need to know about what you're doing internally to keep the community safe. This is such a public health issue. How you deal with employees is such a public health issue and a threat to the community that it is, I think, in general, probably a good idea to have a good plan for how you're going to communicate externally those things that are meant primarily for internal uses. I'd add one quick thing to that. I, I think that there's that category where you know you have the the public health um, um, aspect of this that you need to weigh carefully. But then there's also the the desire among some organizations to communicate proactively, and we've seen this with just numerous organizations over the last six weeks or so. You just have to make sure that you are doing right by your people and living your values before you go external and, and yep. start talking about that. Because if you can't actually back that up internally, um, you're going to hear about it. You'll hear about it from your people, and they'll talk about it externally, and then the world is going to know about it. So th there is a lot of opportunity for great storytelling here and, and hero stories and things like that. But it, it's very important to take a close look inside the, the walls of the organization to make sure you're truly supporting your people um, in the way that they need before you go out and, and perhaps misrepresent them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, John, a question has come in for you. Um, there seem to be so many scenarios these days that, that we could spend time getting ready for. Do you have any tips for focusing your attention maybe picking a couple, prioritizing um, as you start the, start the process? Well, I, I think it goes back to kind of intelligence and, and, and having listening uh, out there to understand how your organization is being affected by the conversation that's happening out there. So, you know, prioritizing scenarios or thinking about what, you know, what might, what might come at you. Um, it's probably important to make sure that you kind of have a, a little bit of a, a feeler or an over the horizon um, social listening or, you know, media um, uh, monitoring and, and just kind of a understanding what your audiences are, are talking about and, and worried about. Some of that we talked about, you know, obviously health and safety is an issue. Um, financial security is an issue. You know, those are the things that, that you know, you might want to start looking at and thinking about, okay, how, how do we, you know, how do we fold into those kind of conversations? And if there's one theme, I think, or thread throughout this whole conversation today, it's been about and prioritizing your employees, supporting your employees and making sure that you're taking care of them. So, you know, preparing now by developing a plan about how you're going to approach and uh, communicating the, what you are doing for your employees, um, and talking about how you're helping either the communities that you operate in, you know, starting uh, any kind of help uh, with material development, message development, um, but trying to wait, uh, dive into what are the conversations that are taking place in your sector or in your region. Um, that that would impact uh, that would impact you and that you could have an impact on. So that's probably the first place that 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 uh, would make sense to to really get a get a good hold on what the conversation is, and then thinking about the, the macro concerns of your employees and other stakeholders. How would you communicate to those folks about what the next steps and the next waves of this crisis are going to be? That's terrific. Thank you, John, so much. Um, you know there are there are no more questions that have been asked and i'm also cognizant of the fact that uh, as we've said everybody is running around and doing more jobs than they're used to doing and incredibly busy so it's uh, only three minutes before the end and i think the best thing is to give you three minutes to take this all in 
um, and think about how it uh, can be used as you go about uh, the rest of your day and your week and your month. Um, I want to close by saying thanks once again to everybody who has um, participated both on the panel and as attendees. We hope that you all stay safe. Um, we um, are thankful for your time and we'll talk with you soon. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Bye.